Well, this afternoon, it's no uh, surprise to any of us that there's a game being played called the Super Bowl. And at this Super Bowl, you're going to see some amazing celebrations, amazing celebrations. How many of you would say that one of your two favorite teams is playing in the Super Bowl? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> I, 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 there's one. I, I had someone uh, say that they were still hoping the 49ers could pull it out. And that would be a, a miracle of epic proportions if that happened. But anyway, you're going to see a lot of celebrations. You're going to see some on the field. You're going to see some on the sidelines, some in the stands, wherever you go to watch the game today. If, if you do that, uh, there's going to probably be times that you're celebrating and cheering and doing that. Um, you're also going to see some people who are crying and whining and sad. You're going to see all those things. Because one side wins and one side loses. One side celebrates and one side mopes. And I'll let you figure out who that's going to be. Uh, my team was out a long time ago, so the moping is done. Uh, but we come to these times and, and there's always this thing of, wow, you know, a team accomplishes something or scores or whatever it might be. And we've been in this series called FIT, which stands for Followers in Training. But we're using the metaphor kind of of getting in shape or, you know, the beginning of the year, we try to do all those things to make that happen. But almost any coach or trainer will tell you that there are little goals along the way that you need to celebrate, that you need to take those things and say, wow, yeah, look at this, look at this great thing that happened. And it might be, you know, if you're working out, you, you finish a week of workouts and say, ooh, you know, high five to me, I finished a work, workout, or I hit a certain weight, or uh, I ran a certain distance, and I know at times for me, uh, when I st first started running and hitting some of those milestones, it was little teeny goals, and like every, every single telephone pole was a woo, little party, okay, I reached that, and did it. but they'll tell you celebrations will help get you to that ultimate goal, and here's the crazy thing, spiritually, it's not really any different. In fact, the Bible calls us to these moments and times when we celebrate not what we've done, but what God has done. And we look around, we say, oh, thank you, God. Look what you, look what you accomplished and look what you, look what you did. And so today really is a day of celebration. We're going to look biblically at what that's about. We're going to take a look at what God has been doing around here and what he's calling us to. And we're going to celebrate those things as well. I started this series back in, in the first part of January uh, using a passage from Luke that, that Jesus uh, had been teaching and pouring into his disciples, not just the twelve, but into this larger group of, of his followers. And it got to, to Luke chapter 10, and you don't need to turn there, but Jesus sent them out, sent out these 72 to go in his name and do good works. And that passage is really what, what was the catalyst for this whole series because I thought about what those followers would have, would have thought because they'd been listening, they'd been watching Jesus, all those things happen. And then Jesus says, now I want you to go. And you could see them thinking, no, 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 we, we just kind of follow along with you. And Jesus sends them out ahead to prepare the way and to, and to share good news and to go into villages and towns. And so they had to step out of their comfort zone, and Jesus was with them in spirit, but to step out and to begin to do those things. And I believe that's God's call for us. We come to church, and we listen, and we read, and we, we do all those things, and we say, yay, God. And then out there, we think, well, what do I do? Well, that's where God's calling us. And last weekend was a challenge to take that call and to go out and love and do good works in Jesus' name. But when we go back to those 72, at the very end of that time when he sent them out, this is going to come up on the screen, in Luke 10, 17, uh, it says this, that when the 72 disciples returned after doing all this, it says they joyfully reported to him, to Jesus, all that had happened. And if you were to go and read that, you'll see them going, oh, Jesus, you'll never believe what happened. It was this. And even the demons obeyed our prayers and we went into villages. It was this excitement because it was, wow, look what was accomplished, Jesus, in your name. And there was joy in that celebration. In the Old Testament, there is this place where Nehemiah has come back and they've rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem and they're once again starting to be a people together. And in Nehemiah 12, it says this, many sacrifices were offered on that joyous day for God had given the people cause for great joy. Let me just tell you, God's given us cause for great joy. So we get to celebrate too. And it says, the women and children also participated in the celebration and the joy of the people of Jerusalem could be heard far away. It'd be like if, if you lived by a stadium and you could hear the crowd, ah, you know, and you go, wow, I wonder what's going, something great is happening. Well, my goal today is not that people 
you know, coming down the freeway would hear us yell. We're not going to put up the noise meter on the screens and see how loud you can be. But my hope and prayer is that you would walk out of here today with this joy that is just kind of churning inside you because you begin to realize what God is doing and what he wants to do and where he's leading us to. And that we would walk out today going, man, God, God's doing great stuff. And it's time for us to celebrate. So that's what we're going to do today. The question, of course, is why do we celebrate? Is it just because of stuff that happens or, or what's really going on? So I'm going to give you three things today. I want you to write these down and uh, we're going to kind of divide these up and tell some stories and do that. It's going to be great today. So here's the first one. We celebrate because Jesus turns death into life. We celebrate because Jesus turns death into life. Now, if you're there in Luke chapter 7, I want to read you a story and uh, this is an interesting encounter because Jesus has all these people that are following after him, not just the 12, not just the 70, but we get this idea of crowds that are following him because he's done amazing miracles. He's, he's fed 5,000 with you know, just a few loaves and fishes, and people are always wondering, what's Jesus going to do next? They can't, they've never seen anything like this before. So imagine this long, drawn-out crowd of people following after Jesus in anticipation of what he might do, and they're heading towards this little tiny village. So that's, that's one parade, one train coming into the city. But as they approach the city, there's another procession that's coming out, only it's vastly different. And that's where we pick it up in Luke 7, verse 12. As they approached the village gate, they, Jesus and the followers, met a funeral procession. A woman's only son was being carried out for burial, and the mother was a widow. So I want you just to figure out her, her scenario here. She's already lost her husband. She's a widow. And now her only son has died. So this woman is facing loss and tragedy and pain and grief and all those things. And it says, when Jesus saw her, his heart broke. And he said to her, don't cry. Then he went over and touched the coffin and the pallbearer stopped, and he said, young man, I tell you, get up. Now, let me stop there for just for a second. Let me just encourage you never to do this at a funeral, okay? <laughs> I've done a lot of them. You just don't go there. It's hard for people. I mean, all those things, just like, what a crazy thing to do. Now, imagine the two crowds, and imagine what they're feeling at this point. The crowd following Jesus, who have seen him do amazing, miraculous things, are thinking, he just told this dead guy to get up. I mean, they're in anticipation going, do you think that's really going to happen? They're excited about the possibilities. But imagine the other crowd thinking, how dare you? You know what this woman has been through? And you're stopping this and saying things like that. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there were people on the other side of the coin that were angry at Jesus for, for daring to step into this heartbreaking scenario. So a lot of different emotions going on. Then it says this, the dead son sat up and began talking. And Jesus presented him to his mother. And they all realized they were in a place of holy mystery and that God was at work among them. These are key lines I want you to catch because it's not just for 2,000 years ago. This is for us today. God is at work among us. And then I love this line. They were quietly worshipful and then noisily grateful calling out among themselves, God is back looking to the needs of his people. I, I would rephrase that or, or correct them to say, God isn't back, he's always been there. But God is at work as we give him room to work. See, here's the deal. Every one of us experiences loss and tragedy and pain and hurt. It may be truly the loss of someone close to you. It may be the end of a marriage. It may be a broken friendship. It may be a lifelong dream that just kind of spins sideways. But here's the deal. God takes our lowest, most challenging, grief-stricken moments, and he can transform those into times of celebration and joy. See, the good news about Jesus is really good news because when that good news comes in contact, contact with bad news, there is something transformational that takes place. Just like that Jesus procession meets the funeral procession and things are never the same again. That's always what happens when Jesus steps into the scene. In Psalm 30, David wrote this, you have turned my mourning into joyful dancing. You've taken away my clothes of mourning and clothed me instead with joy that I might sing praises to you and not be silent. That's what celebration is. 
O Lord my God, I will give you thanks forever. And I just want you to know that when Jesus shows up, that's the radical thing that takes place. Today, we have a chance to celebrate because Jesus has brought us life. He's brought hope into hopeless situations. He's taken the death of dreams and relationships of hope. He's taken the death that sin and shame brings, and he instead brings resurrection. You know, that's what Easter is all about. On a Friday, right, Good Friday, Jesus is led to this, this hill. He's nailed to a cross. He's beaten and bloody and bruised, and he's executed on that cross. And I think all hope is gone. And three days later, there's an empty tomb, and Jesus brought life again. And that's exactly what he does in us. Everything that's dead and broken and hurting and wounded, he begins a transformation. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not saying that every hard situation suddenly becomes, ah, you know, lollipops and roses. That's not what it is. But the celebration is, is that no matter what our circumstance, Jesus steps into it, and he does a renewal in us. It may not change the circumstances, but he brings joy and life into us because that's who he is. The second thing is this. We celebrate because Jesus turns self-focus into service and love. He turns self-focus into service and love. See, our tendency, and we talked about this a couple weeks ago, our tendency is to, is to continue to look inward. What do I need? What do I want? What about... What about my concerns? What about where I'm at? And and we we tend to to focus there. And there's something about coming to Christ that he begins to do a work in us. Now, here's the thing. God knows you have needs. God knows that I have needs. He's not discounting those. He's not dismissing those and saying, hey, it's time to put on your big boy pants and just face this, and who cares about you? It's not about that. He meets our needs, and he pours into our life, And out of the overflow of his blessing and his touch and his presence in our life, we're able to take that and give to others. He's not discounting where you're at. He cares about that. And he wants to fill you up so that you can in turn pour that into someone else. Look what it says in Acts 1, the very beginning of the church. It says, Jesus talking, it says, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, you will receive power. He knew what they needed. You will receive power, and then you will tell people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Did you you notice the process there? God recognizes what they need, and he says, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, and he is going to give you power. He knew that he knew what they needed to influence and change the world, and he knew that they needed to be filled up first, and so that's exactly what God does. And then these ordinary people, out of the overflow of the Holy Spirit, out of the overflow of what God was doing in them, they began to reach into their neighborhoods and into their community and into their city. See, God fills his people first. And you, you, as you follow Christ, he wants to fill you up to overflowing so that it will spill over and touch others. You know what the book of Acts really is all about? Some people say, well, it's about the early church. It's about the, the birth and the, and the growth of those, of those first years of the apostles and the disciples and all those things. And yes, it is about that. But I'll even simplify it more. The book of Acts is about people telling other people about Jesus. It's about people, regular people, telling and living and showing other people who Jesus really is. And it changes everything. And that's God's plan. And you know what I've found? I've found that people tell other people what they're most excited about, right? Have you ever been to a, a, like a restaurant and you just went, that was just amazing. That was amazing. There's this place over, so see, I'm going to tell you what I'm excited about. There's this place over in the Bay Area, and if you want to know more, I can give you the address and everything. It's over not too far from Stanford, so if you're ever over there visiting someone or if you have to go there for health reasons, it's just up the road a little bit in this little downtown area, and there's this place, and they make their own pastrami. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, that's right. It's not even lunch. Some of you are thinking, yeah. Because today, you know, all diets are off. You know, it's just about eating. And you're thinking, yeah, and that's what this place is. And it's just amazing. So anytime I know someone's going over there, I go, hey, let me tell you, there's this place. You got to get there, pastrami. I mean, we get so excited about things, and then it spills over in our conversation. And I think about what God is doing around here. And the more I hear conversations and I listen in and different things that are happening, it's like, we're excited that God is at work. 
And it's starting to come out in conversations. It's, it's coming out when we start telling people what we're doing and what we're about and even what happened last weekend. And some of those stories are just, just amazing to me because we can't help but talk about what's been filling us up, and it's Jesus. In Ephesians 3, Paul wrote this. God can do anything, you know, far more than you could ever imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams. And he does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us, his spirit deeply and gently within us. God begins to do this work more than we could ask, imagine, or pray for. He begins to do that work, and it begins to spill over. And that's what you did this last weekend. That's how you stepped into this fit serve and made a huge difference. And I want to read you a couple stories. And uh, while I'm sharing these, I do want to point out one thing. In your program, there is this little card, and it, it's, it's for you. And what I'd like you to do is sometime today or in the next week or so, I'd like you just to write a few things on here. First of all, what did you do? Maybe not exactly last weekend, because I had someone come up and they say, Dave, we really, I really wanted to serve, and so I had this great thing come up. I, I never could have saw it coming, and here it was, but I really need to apologize. It was on Wednesday. It's okay, okay? You can serve on Wednesdays and Tuesdays and Thursdays and Fridays. What, what God wants is for your eyes to be open of what He's doing around you all the time, not just when we set aside a weekend or do that, but God's doing great things. And so, just quickly answer, don't put any names on here. This is not about us or our name or, or anything like that. But what did you do? Where did you serve and where did you show kindness and love and grace? What was the little thing that God called you into? And then what was your experience? What happened? What, you know, just, just share a little bit. And then in the back hallway, there's this four by eight fit serve kind of board mounted on the wall. And there's a tape dispenser there. And I want you to take your card and just tape it up there. If you've got a picture from your weekend, bring it next week and tape it up there. And over these next couple of weeks, I want you just to see those stories. And we even have another board we're going to put up when that one's full, and we'll just keep putting those up. And you can go back and look and say, wow, look what God did. Not to be impressive for us, not to try to one-up each other, but to be encouraged and inspired to say, what is, what is God wanting to do in me, and how can that happen? So let me read you just a couple, couple stories, eh, more than a couple, but... These are cool. Uh, this is from a guy who's 20 years old, recently started attending. Uh, he even says this. He goes, I didn't know what I should do considering I'm just starting out discovering a deeper relationship with God. He talks about it at work. Uh, he was with his manager, just the two of them. It was a slow night, and his manager started complaining of a headache. And uh, he said, her and I have talked about God before, but she said she's never been religious and doesn't know what she believes. Nonetheless, I told her I would pray that God would restore her health. And he says, that night before I went to bed, I prayed for her. And here's the thing. Next night at work, I asked her if she was feeling any better. And she said, she still had a little bit of a headache, but was doing better. And he says, I felt something in me, listen to this, uh, something in me telling me that I should do something or say something. Have you ever had that feeling? Like, oh, I know, what do I do? You know, I feel like God's calling me to maybe do something, but I'm trying to figure it out. And he said, I quickly said a prayer and asked God to open my eyes and to guide me. Customers had left the store, and now it was just her and I alone, and I felt as if this was a sign from God, so I did something I'd never done before. I remember growing up, I'd heard something along the lines that where two or more are gathered, that God is right there. So I asked my manager if it would be okay if I prayed aloud for her. She seemed a bit weirded out, <laughs> but, but... Agreed, hesitantly agreed. I went over, put a hand on her shoulder, and said a quick prayer for her, simply asking God to heal her, to help her with whatever obstacles she was facing, and to guide her. It was a small gesture, he writes, a small act of kindness, but it was my chance to serve. I felt really good after this happened, and I hope to ask her to come to church with me soon. See, it, it's more than just, I mean, and I'm going to read some stories. Some of you went out and fed the homeless, and, and those are fantastic things. But sometimes we think that's the only way to serve. But see, there are situations every single day that are right around you. It may be praying with a coworker, and they may be weirded out about the whole thing. But just that gentle, would you mind if I prayed for you? It may be just a smile. It may be a gesture, a, a, just, you know, that little act of kindness that just gets someone through the day. I don't know where God's going to ask you to plant those seeds or, or make an impact, but He's doing it every single day. Listen to this one. 
I just wanted to let you know that my neighbors were completely shocked when I knocked on their door with Little Caesar's pizza and also gave them some cash. They have five children and they really struggle. But I told them that our church wanted us to bring the church to the community and for them to keep their faith. In addition, whatever we were going to give to the church, we were to give to them. And all they could say was, really? 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 (laughs) I love this one. My husband and I and our daughter decided to take in our recycling during church time on Sunday and give the money to someone who was also at the recycling center. Of course, when we were there, no one else was. So we went over to Walmart, and we sat in our car for a bit trying to decide what to do. And we saw a rougher-looking guy pull up in an old car, and uh, we ended up going in thinking, well, we're not sure what to do, but we'll figure out when we get inside. Not long after walking around trying to figure out what God wanted us to do, we spotted that same guy from the parking lot. He was carrying around a pack of diapers, and he stopped and scanned the diapers at a price checker, uh, probably to see if he could afford it. He then went and got baby wipes and a package of toilet paper, and we got behind him in the checkout line. I love it. It's like strategic. Let's get behind him. (laughs) It's a longer line. We don't care. Let's get behind him, you know. And so got behind him and watched him. Uh, When he pulled out his wallet, my husband stepped up and said, we got this, and paid cash for the items, and then had the clerk give the guy the change. The guy was shocked, grateful, and shook up. He kept saying, are you sure? Then he said, God bless you shook my husband's hand, and before he walked away, came back and hugged him and thanked us again. My husband said, God bless you too. By the way, just so you know, this is a gift from God. I talked to the guy this week, and he said, you know the thing that amazed me most from that experience is I walked, around, I walked out of there thinking, how many times do I go into the store, and I'm so focused and single focused, and situations like that are all around me every time. And it may not always be pain for someone's items or whatever, but just am I aware that people around me are in need? And he said, that was this wake-up call to recognize it's all around me all the time. Let me see with Jesus' eyes. Uh, I would like, here's another one. I'd like to share our story on how we became the church this weekend. We began with a lot of prayer this last week on how we could serve, and it came to us to help the homeless during these cold months. We began with collecting warm blankets from friends and family. Then today, we teamed up with another church family who had baked muffins. On our way out, we stopped and got some hot coffee. Two families... We joined together and drove around Turlock handing out warm blankets, muffins, and hot coffee. Along the way, we prayed with several of the people we met. Truly was a blessed day being our church in the community. Here's another one I love. Uh, For this weekend, a few of us decided we wanted to do something for our friend, a single mom, and her four kids. We set our sights on spending the day making them smile as much as possible. After looking around for some coupons, we decided on a day at FunWorks, followed, I love this, by pizza and donuts for dinner. And he's, I love this. He says, there's something great about telling a five-year-old, I love you, and Jesus love you, loves you, so let's go ride go-karts and eat pizza. <laughs> the kids got to spend the day on go-karts, playing mini golf, climbing through the play place, and playing in the arcade, while us grown-ups tried to keep up. I love new life, and usually not making it to service during the weekend throws me off for the week, but seeing the look of pure joy on a kid's face while he drives a bumper car is pretty great, too. Another one, we were not able to do anything on Sunday because of a family tragedy, so as I stood in line at the store today, I overheard an elderly woman and her grown daughter asking each other if they could pay for the food. After I bought mine, I lingered a little longer, and I had just gotten paid $1,000. I didn't know how much food they had bought, but I smiled as I saw it was a little over $100. What a coincidence. If you understand the tithe, it was a tithe on what, on what she had made. She goes, I stepped up and said, I'll pay for your groceries. And when they objected, I said, our pastor said the church is not a building. We're to be the church, and I want to do this for you. The cash register lady, the bag boy, the people behind these ladies just stood there looking shocked. The ladies asked, what church do you go to? And I said, New Life. And they were stunned at first and then said, God bless you. And they hugged me. And as I left, I heard them all saying how they couldn't believe what had just happened. Last one. My wife and I were able to visit an old friend who lives in Don Pedro, but is currently in rehab facility. We were able to spend time with him, pray with him, and read scripture. And because of your suggestion of giving what we would normally give at church, we were also able to help his wife with money needed for gas going back and forth several times a week. Thank you for the shove out the door. (laughs) Anytime, anytime, I'll shove you out the door. I just let, yeah, give God a hand. And, And if I can just tell you, that is the tip of the iceberg. 
I'll just, I'll just briefly, you know, you know what I heard uh, in, in emails and stories and just through conversations? You know what you guys gave this last week? You gave time. You gave a listening ear. I've heard of tents given away, sleeping bags given away, blankets, socks, uh, food, canned food, meals, uh, paying bills for people. Uh, someone had written in that their neighbor at 4 o'clock was having their electricity turned off, gone through a tragedy, has lost everything. They paid their TID bill to get their electricity um, on. Uh, someone gave a car away. Um, I mean, just over and over, haircuts. And, and just, I mean, the list just goes on and on and on and firewood and rain jackets and tarps and all kinds of things for those who are homeless and for neighbors. Um, some of you told stories about how you met your neighbors for the, sometimes for the first time, didn't even know what was going on and God continually put them on your heart and you stepped into those situations and you made a difference. And let me just tell you, just to remind you, this is not about us. It's not about, hey, yay me, and look what I did. It's about, yay God, and look what he's able to do when we present ourselves and say, here I am, God, use me. Open my eyes, let me see what's going on. And God takes those situations, and he does great things. I heard a story uh, last week of a group. Uh, it was kind of a small group and some family members. They got together and made care packages with socks and uh, some food and some different things like that. And they got in an RV together, and they drove around town. They're just looking for people in need. And one guy said, man, it was crazy. We were going by this one street in the alley, and they saw people in the alley, and this RV, into the alley. Can you imagine if you're in need and you see this RV like bearing down on you, and all of a sudden they slam on the brakes, get out and hand you a care package and some food and pray with you and, and help you. I mean, it was, just, it was just amazing what God did. You see, this is what Christ offers to us and then through us, offers life, an abundant life. And there are so many times we try to find fulfillment in searching for the perfect house or the perfect car or the perfect job or the perfect spouse or the perfect whatever it is we're looking for, but true fulfillment, true life comes only in Jesus, just Jesus. And it changes everything. So we celebrate because God does that in us. The third thing is this, write it down. We celebrate because Jesus turns emptiness into abundance. He turns emptiness where we lack and where we struggle and where we come up saying, I, I, I don't have, there's nothing I can bring. And instead, he fills us up and brings provision, brings blessing, and brings life more than we could ever know. John 10.10, 10, Jesus said this, the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy, but my purpose is to give life in all of its fullness. Jesus has come not just to give us life, but life to the full. He's come to bring us joy. He's come to bring us peace that goes beyond our understanding, goes beyond our circumstances. He's come to give us love. And as David writes, it's this love as deep and wide as the oceans. That's why Jesus has come. On your sheet, there's that verse, my purpose is to give life in all its fullness. Would you circle the word fullness? And then right under it or next to it or somewhere, I want you to write this word overflowing. And then I want you to put a little arrow pointing back at fullness. Because that's what Jesus comes to give us, overflowing fullness. And what that means is that that metaphor of our life being like a cup, that he fills that cup not just to the full, but over the top. In a nutshell, Jesus has come to give us more life, more joy, more love, more forgiveness, more purpose than we ever could have imagined. And why wouldn't we want to celebrate that? And it's not just celebrating what we get, it's celebrating the giver to us, the one who loves us so deeply and freely that he has poured out on us. We went from nothing to abundance. And I think of how God has taken this church family from a handful of people who truly wanted to see something, who gathered together, I don't know if you're aware of this, but coming up this Easter in just a couple months will be 40 years since this church started, Easter of 1976, and yeah, e Easter of 1976, this small group of people gathered in what is now Jura's Pizza down in Center Street in Turlock, and they gathered together, and all they wanted to do is see God do something, see God do something. And they prayed, and they worshiped, and they worked hard, and they studied, and they celebrated, and they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed, God, here we are. Use us. 
move in us. Bring new life to this community and beyond. And he's done that. And something has been happening around here in this, in this last season. We have seen God continually uh, grow this church and do things that we never could have imagined. It's not us. It's not any planning that takes place. It's not something that we have figured out and that we've dialed in for God. He has been at work, and He continues to invite us to join Him into this thing. And I love it because there's nothing that we can strategize about. There's nothing that we can go, if we do X, then Y happens, or if we do A, B, and C, then we know. That we just are saying, God, here we are, and we want to remain submitted before Him and humble before Him and obedient to Him, saying, God, you lead and we will follow. And we continue to join Him in that. And I don't know, there's something in this last season, something in this last kind of period of time that we've seen God kind of continue to bubble up among us, His work and His will and His way. And as we've followed in that, God just continues to do some amazing things. And I want to take just a few minutes today and share with you about some of the things that I believe that God is preparing us for. We want to celebrate the past, even this past week. We want to celebrate what God is doing in this moment, but we also want to look forward and see, God, what, what are you preparing for us? I shared with you back in December that the land that we had purchased to the south of us here uh, a couple of years ago, that we were able to sell a, a a piece of it, the smaller piece of it, with that Subaru, the old Subaru building, to the Turlock School District. And that was just an amazing miracle that God brought about to provide for us as we move forward. But we've also been working on plans for building and for growth here in His design. Not because buildings are our focus, because because they're not, but we need the, the resources and the place so that we can continue to gather together, we can continue to worship together, to grow together, to learn, to be discipled, to, to grow deep in our faith. But here's the exciting part, so that we can be sent back again into our community, into our city and region, and be the church everywhere we go. Coming together is great. And the Bible says don't give up this habit to worship together, celebrate, and grow together. But then we, we go back into where we live and work and go to school and all those things, and we bring Christ. We become lights in dark places. And that's what we want to do. But we know that God is continuing to grow us here. And the truth is we've run up against some real barriers that you're all very aware, aware of. We know that you know, this, this room can only seat so many. And every weekend, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we have five areas around this campus where people gather to participate in a service. This is the main one. We have a room upstairs here we call the family room. And right now, there are people sitting in that room watching this on video, and they're participating in this service today. Every single weekend in our back hallway, there are people lining the chairs. In fact, often we set up two, sometimes even three rows of extra chairs. We take them all up before you leave because you just trip over them, you know? We have to pull them up out of the back hallway because people are coming and they keep coming. And people sit in the cafe and they participate in the service and we pull a big screen out onto the patio and people sit outside and, and they watch the service because there's simply no more room uh, for them to fit in. And we don't even want to start talking about traffic and parking and all those things. You were in it today coming in. And I watched out in front and I saw the line of cars trying to get out while you're trying to get in and we're trying to get spaces. And somehow in the midst of all that, God has kept us peaceful, you know, together. But, you know, it's just this, this crazy thing, crazy parking and traffic and that thing of, okay, what do, what do we do and, and what does this look like? And so as we begin praying and, and seeking after God, what does He have for us? And so... Um, so in this next season, we are moving uh, towards building so that we can continue to grow, impact our world and our community, and then send us back out to do that. So I'm going to show you a few pictures and slides to kind of get you on board. And I'll also let you know that afterwards, some of you already did this already, but there's a little tent out there. And I'm going to show you in just a minute some, some uh, sketches of the building that we're looking at. You can see a three-dimensional model out there that, that Pastor Brett made. This guy's amazing. Made this beautiful model that comes apart. You can see the second floor and all those things. There's also some design sketches and things out there that you can look at. But uh, let's back up and start at the beginning. We're going to show you a picture here of our site plan. So this is our current uh, facility. You see we're all the way in the right in our current uh, room here, and then the four smaller classroom buildings out around our quad. And our desire is to finish the quad to truly bring in that fourth side. 
And that's where we're going to build a, a new sanctuary. I'm going to tell you about that in just a minute, what it's going to look like and, and some of those things. But it's going to give us the opportunity to continue to grow, but unify our campus together around the quad, all kind of facing the same area to highlight families and relationships and communi community together. On the left side of the new sanctuary is a youth center, a youth building that's going to be there for our students, junior high, high school, and college at various times. Uh, I also had someone uh, say, man, look at all that parking you know, that's so you can actually get in and out and do that. There will also be a new entrance to the south going into the Auto Plaza um, cul-de-sac there. Uh, someone also looked at that and go, hey, that's right where our baseball field is. Right. So we're moving that out to the new property that we acquired to the south of us. That'll be a softball and soccer field and everything out there. One other little quick thing at the very top, you'll see a semicircle up there. The city, and we don't know the timing of this yet, the city is going to bring in another cul-de-sac from Tegner uh, into, uh, they'll finish it right at the edge of our property, but we will have access, uh, we'll be one of the kind of the offshoots of that. So we will actually have three entrances and exits onto our campus here from various locations. Yes, <laughs> it'll be a great thing to have. We won't know what to do. We can just like drive out and have uh, that thing. Or maybe not. Maybe it'll still be crazy. We don't know. So uh, I want to show you just now a sketch of, of the main building that, uh, that we're going to be building. Let's go ahead and put that next one up. So that's just a front look. This is if you were standing in the freeway looking back towards uh, our property. By the way, don't stand on the freeway. But that's what it would look like, uh, the entrance there. And then off to the right, you see another covering. That's going to head towards this towards us, towards the quad area here. Now, here's the crazy thing. If you look at the entrance there, you see the, the doors and the glass. It's going to be about 18, 20 feet high and 70 feet long of glass and doors to allow entrance into uh, the facility. Here's the crazy thing. When you look at our facility now, most of you come through one door over there, right? Have you ever come in and go, why one door? One door. I mean, it's just kind of insane. So we're going to have a lot of doors and a lot of ways you can get in. But here's what I will promise you. I will still be standing out there every single weekend welcoming you in, <laughs> high-fiving our kids and doing that. So what will it look like in size? Uh, back up one more. Back up to that first one. There you go. So uh, this is gonna, it's going to be a different kind of construction. It's going to be a larger building, obviously. You can tell by the, the first slide. Um, so it, quite a bit more square footage uh, allowing us to, to build or to, to grow through that. Just to give you context for it, this current uh, auditorium seats about 425 people. And you may not be aware of this, but uh, every weekend, and we've been growing, but uh, these last couple months in, in our growth, we, we have between 2,000 and 2,200 people who are here on a weekend. It's a lot of people, a lot of cars, a lot of traffic, seating 425 people. So we are jammed in in so many places. So this, this new auditorium uh, initially is going to seat about double that. So we're going to be in the seven to 800 range for seating. But it's going to be designed in such a way that we can continue to uh, take out some kind of walls. And we're, we're going to initially constrain it. So to go from this size to something way, way larger would be hard. So we're going to do it in stages. But ultimately, that auditorium has the capacity to seat about 1,600 people all in one sitting. Yeah, so it's going to be great. And... And, and I just want to tell you, I'm not trying to sell you something here, but I truly believe that God's going to fill that because there are people throughout our region that need to know Christ. And so we're preparing for what he's going to do. But we're going to kind of do it in stages through that. And I know what you may be thinking. Are we just going to simply go to one service? And the answer to that is no. Uh, we'll probably back off one, but we're going to continue. We got a huge clap last night, but we're going to continue our Saturday night services, and we're going to continue two Sunday services to start, at least for the time being, as we move into the new space. So excited uh, about that. Um, but to let you also know, this is a different kind of construction, uh, the main building of this. It is, uh, is an aluminum truss structure. The outside walls are 12 inches thick. It's covered inside and out with a tensioned membrane that we can color to match and enhance our current facility. It's highly energy efficient in places like Saddleback Church, Rick Warren down south, um, the Harvard Business School, Grand Canyon University, and hundreds of other organizations and businesses are moving to this different kind of construction. It goes up very quick. Now, the inside will have to build out traditionally in traditional construction, but the outside will go up very quick and at a fraction of the cost. And we're still in development for what those final costs will be, 
But I just want you to know this, and I know I've said this before, but my heart is for us to grow and to impact lives and to people, and we want to continue to invest in ministry and in people, not in mortgages. And so our, our goal is to get this up moving quickly, but also to do it at a, at a way that we're not stuck for decades paying off debt. We want to invest that into lives and into kingdom work, and so we're going to be able to do that in, a, in a, an effective, efficient way that moves us forward into the future. So let me give you a little picture of the inside of that. There we go. Uh, this is actually just kind of a picture, a graphic representation of the model that you can see back there. The right-hand side is mostly auditorium space. Some of those large wings in the back of that room are removable as we're able to add more space and seating. The front half is two-story. Uh, classrooms uh, down below where our youngest kids will be, uh, opportunities for classes and different things upstairs as well, uh, a large open lobby area that you'll have, and then we're going to do something crazy. I know some of you who've been here for a period of time are, are going to just be shocked at this. We're going to actually place the men's and women's bathrooms in the same vicinity <laughs> towards each other. You know, we just thought that'd be a good thing to do. Uh, the, the upstairs will be fully accessible, uh, ADA compliance. There will be an elevator and things like that so that we can get up no matter what your status uh, health-wise is. You're going to be able to get to all areas uh, of the church. So we're really excited about that. The front end as well, on the left-hand side, you'll see uh, that lobby area there. We'll still have a cafe and all the different areas, some seating. Uh, it will be sound protected and isolated from the auditorium. I know right now we always have to tell, you know, shh, service has started, don't talk. We're going to be able to just fully have fun and laugh and talk and do all that while a service is going on because they'll be isolated from one another. But to give you a perspective on the size of that lobby that we'll have as a chance and a place where we can meet and connect and be family together, that lobby is the size of this auditorium. So it'll be large space to do that. And then you can exit even out this side towards the quad, towards where kids will be playing out on the grass. It's going to be a family uh, area to do that. Lastly, uh, this slide you can see, uh, pick the next one. There we go. So you see out to the right, the covered area there, and that will all be seating and patio and looking into the quad. We want to be able to unite our people together, not just structurally, but emotionally and spiritually and connecting as a community together. Uh, I want to put the first slide back up again, and I want to read this verse from Psalm 6511. Psalm 65 has been my chapter that God gave me back in December that I was reading, and it was just like, this is for us this year. This is for me this year. David was writing this as a prayer and a praise to God, and the key verse is verse 11, and he says this, you crown the year, God, with a bountiful harvest. Even the hard pathways overflow with abundance. I know there will be challenges this year. We will, we will face some difficulties, but I believe that God has brought us into this year as a year of harvest and abundance, and, and I just want you to continue to be praying for that. After the service, make sure you go look at the model. We're going to have those up for, for weeks and weeks and weeks, so you'll have a chance to look at the pictures. But be, be praying, because on April 7th, we go to the Turlock Planning Commission and looking for approval to this so that we can begin to break ground. And our heart and our goal is, is that in 2016, that we will stand together as a church family in that new facility, and we will praise and honor and worship God. And so we're looking forward to what He's going to accomplish this year. So. I'm going to ask our ushers uh, to get ready. I'm going to finish uh, today by sharing something with you that comes right from my heart. But one of the things how we're going to conclude today is get by receiving communion together. And uh, they're going to begin to hand that out right now. And I want you to hold the bread and hold the cup uh, as they hand that out. But uh, while they're doing that, and I know this may be hard or challenging, uh, ushers, you can come on right down and just begin to hand it out. But I want to share, you some, share with you something that I wrote a couple of years ago as I had some time away and I was thinking about this family and this body and new life and what God wanted to accomplish. And I wrote this out and it's called Imagine a Church. And I will tell you that I will get emotional reading this because this is my heart for us. This is my heart for this family. New life is not just the name of a church, but the reality of what we have in Christ. New life is not just a one-time experience, but an ongoing renewal as Christ is at work in each of us. This is our heartbeat for each person throughout our community and beyond. Our desire is to be more than a place, but a people, a family that reaches with open arms to anyone, young or old, rich or poor, every ethnicity, those who are hurting and broken, and those who seem 
like they have it all. In Christ, we get to be a people, His people, His church that lives as a brand new creation. So imagine a church where each person can live and experience freedom, true freedom that allows us to be all that God intended us to be. Imagine a church where love and grace are lived out. In fact, love and grace become the cornerstone of all that we do. Imagine a church where evangelism happens almost on accident. Rather than afraid or timid about sharing our faith, we simply can't help but share what Christ has done in us and invite others to come join us. Imagine a church where kids are learning the Bible and loving Jesus and living it out. Kids are not the church to come, but they are the church of right now. Imagine a church where students are growing confident in their faith. They know and understand the Bible and they live pure and committed lives. They are not driven by culture, but instead they are the beginning of a spiritual revolution that changes schools in our community. These students are fully engaged in ministry both in the church and out in the world. They are not the church and leaders of tomorrow, but they are the church of right now. Imagine a church made up of small groups of believers growing in their knowledge of Christ and applying it to everyday life. These little families become the true place of connection and friendship and accountability. Imagine a church where worship is expressive and passionate, engaging and creative. Imagine worship not just ending when a service is over, but drawing us into God's presence in such a way that worship continues in our homes, our schools, and our workplaces throughout the week. Imagine a church where compassion for the hurting and the broken runs so deep that we will do whatever it takes to meet needs in Jesus' name. Imagine a church where each one discovers and develops their spiritual gifts and exercises those gifts for the benefit of the church family, but also the community. Imagine a church where we dig into God's word, experience his truth, and then choose to walk in obedience and faith. Imagine a church where generosity would flow and unleash resources to further God's kingdom, both here and around the world. Imagine a church placed on the edge of a major freeway being a visible lighthouse to all who pass by. And then, then, plant outposts of light everywhere in the community, in the region, and beyond. Imagine a church where creativity and excellence would flow, honoring God in everything, from the design of a set to a sign welcoming a child to the planning of a service and into everything that we do. Imagine a church where we would grow spiritually, where we would grow in maturity, and where we would grow numerically. Imagine a church where we would never lose who we're called to be to a program or a performance, that we would choose in every situation to be real and personal and authentic. And finally, imagine a church where we would never forget the lost. We would never get so caught up in the mechanics of ministry that we forget those who are far from God because eternity really does hang in the balance. That's who God has called us to be. That's who he's beckoning us to become even more. And it's all because of what he has done for us. It's all because of his great gift of life. And we're gonna finish our time today by taking the cup and taking the bread and celebrating his goodness. But we're gonna sing, we're gonna sing it one time. Can we do that? And we're gonna put the words up here and let this just be your prayer today as we prepare for this. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, oh, my soul, rejoice, take joy. night that Jesus was betrayed, he met with his followers and his friends, his companions, and he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. 
It's broken for you. It's broken for you. Let's celebrate and eat together. Then Jesus took the cup and he blessed it and said, this is the blood of forgiveness, the blood of a new relationship established and sealed between God and us. Let's drink together. Father, today we are so grateful. We celebrate you and your goodness, your provision, and the life that you bring. We love you, Lord, because you you loved us first. And God, we think back to what you've accomplished in in previous years and previous generations, but, but God, just even days ago, what you accomplished and did, and we just celebrate that today. God, what you're doing right now in this moment as we lean into you, God, we are so grateful for that. And God, as we look forward to the future and what you want to do in us and through us individually, but also as a church together, we can't even really imagine or see it yet, but God, we're excited and we celebrate that. Thank you for giving everything for us. Thank you for sending your son to pay the price so that we can live. God, we thank you. We honor you and we love you. We pray this all today in Jesus' name. Amen.